Thank you, everyone, uh, and I'll uh, be brief. I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you to uh, our little hilltop in Randolph and uh, uh, compliment those of us who are l late enough in changing our snow tires because I think we may need them to get out of town this afternoon. Uh, it's a little chilly out there. Uh, you know, I love this event and this day because it's one of the few times we get to gather uh, across institutions and remind ourselves of our collective impact. And I just think uh, it, it's important validation of the work we do, and it's really important to bear in mind the scale of our impact on the state of Vermont. In the fall of 2014, in terms of in enrolling undergrad Vermont students, the five institutions represented in this room had more than three and a half times the number of undergraduates as the University of Vermont. Even controlling for the Community College of Vermont, the four residential institutions had 42% more Vermont undergraduates. There is no set of institutions in the post-secondary sphere that's having a bitter, bigger impact on Vermont students and the Vermont economy and the state overall than the Vermont State College System. And it's important that we take time in a day like today to recognize our mutual and collective impact. Second, in terms of economic development, each of us plays a vital role in the communities in which we're located. Job growth in Chittenden County has been a robust 4% over the last three or four years. In every other county and state of Vermont, job growth is in decline. If you wanna think about the economic impact we're having as a buffer against those economic challenges, think about what our towns look like in the absence of a higher education institution. We are part of the solution in the long term in the state of Vermont in terms of rural economic development. We are part of a solution in terms of the advancement and development of a, a, a vibrant workforce that is not a constraint on economic growth in the state of Vermont. And we're part of the future of this state's uh, economic and community success. So bear in mind our collective impact as we go through the course of the day today, take pride in the work we're doing and know that there is hard work being done to change that dialogue on a state level in the long term. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for visiting Randolph and I, I hope it's a productive and useful day. My name is Yasmin Ziesler. I'm Chief Academic Officer for the Vermont State Colleges, and it's a, it's a real honor and privilege to be here today to see so many friends. Um, and as Dan said, you know, what I love about the v VSC is the opportunity for collaboration of this day. And we have faculty and staff collaborating. We have institutions cross-collaborations there, presidents, trustees, uh, and other partners. I just saw some of our really good partners from VSAC are joining us here today. And, and as Dan said, you know, we're working with first-generation students, students from modest means. They're some of our best partners in, in reaching out to those students, getting them to our campuses. So it's a pleasure to have them here as well. Thanks for being here. The theme of this year's retreat is Pathways to Success, Access, inclusion and engagement. And there is a graph <laughs> that for me sh really captures uh, what we're all about here and, it, and it, it's part of that collective impact that, that Dan mentioned. The graph is just, it's very simple, it's the United States Census and it shows from 1940 to the present the percentage of, of uh, Americans who earned a high school diploma. And in 1940, that was at 25%, and today it's over 90%. That is, that is an enormous, significant public accomplishment for, for public education, right? Just transformational. Whether, whether you think about that uh, from the perspective of what that's meant for communities, whether you think about that um, from the perspective of all the gaps in, in equity that have been closed as, as a result of that accomplishment, racial ethnic gaps, socioeconomic, gender. What does it mean that 90% of our population has that high school diploma? That's, that's huge. Um, and, and, and whether you think about that in terms of your own family. So it, it's a wonderful accomplishment. And I think what we all know more than anyone else, everyone in this room understands, that we're in the middle of a profound and challenging transformation in higher education as well. That high school diploma has gone from being a luxury um, that actually only one of my grandparents was able to afford and their communities were able to afford. So it's gone from a luxury to being a necessary step on the way to some kind of post-secondary credential. We know that, 
right? Any kind of post-secondary credentials, certificates, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees. Um, and we're really in the midst of figuring out how do we get from where we are here to there, which if you listen to economists is 65% of Vermonters in the next decade need to have some kind of post-secondary degree. That means, that means of the 2,000 kids every year in Vermont who are graduating from high school and not going to college, we need to figure out how to get them in our doors, right? We need to figure out how to support more than 60,000 working age Vermont adults who have some amount of college experience but not a degree. Uh, how do we do that? And we are the place to do that, as Dan said. Uh, so the faculty and staff who plan today's retreat have focused our attention on access, on inclusion, on engagement, high impact engagement. And, and they, they recognize that there's a lot that we can learn from that K-12 experience and, and the work that continues to go on in K-12. Uh, and so for that reason, they invited here today David Silver, who is the founding principal of Think College Now Elementary School, great name, uh, as well as recent CEO of College Track. And there's just one story I want to share about David. When I first contacted him, uh, I explained a little bit about who we are in the VSC, the students we serve, and his immediate response, it was a one sentence email. It said, thank you for your commitment to equity in education. <laughs> it was that focused. And I think you're about to hear from him that kind of focus and that belief in the potential of the success of all students, which I know you all share, um, really can produce the transformative change we need. It can get us from here to there. Uh, so please join me in welcoming David Silver. All right, um, good morning, everybody. All right, let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I, I don't know if you guys got up in the same way I did, but so I, I'm from California, right? And so I, I heard about this Vermont place. I'd never actually been. Um, and I saw these trees and stuff and got lost and my cell phone went off and all that stuff. And, um, and then I, but I heard that there was a pool. And so I was really excited. I don't know if any of you guys stayed at that inn or not. So I was like, hey, uh, you know, is there a pool? They're like, yeah, it's a pool. Uh, of course, they didn't tell me it wasn't heated. Um, but I went in this morning, and there's a jacuzzi right near it. I don't know if anyone joined me or not. I didn't see anyone. I think I saw someone in the elevator. Or, yeah, nice. Um, so um, I wanted uh, to say a couple things um, today to you. Um, so one is that um, if you are interested in just kind of like sitting back and relaxing and not being engaged and not taking anything from this um, and also just like uh, looking at the cell phones or whatever, um, this probably isn't the, isn't the spot for you. Um, if you are interested in actually getting engaged and thinking about what we can do to make sure that all kids have an opportunity to not only get into college but graduate from college, uh, then hopefully you're gonna enjoy today. You're gonna have, you're gonna hear three things. One is you're gonna be inspired. You're gonna be inspired about what is possible, some of the successes that you've already done, I've done a little bit of research on, on some of you, as well as the fact of what we can do together. Two, you're gonna to be empowered. You're gonna be empowered to actually make it happen. Um, and then three is um, you're gonna you're gonna enjoy it a little bit. So uh, before I start, um, I wanted to say, and I, I, I was thinking about like engagement, and I was thinking, what would be a way to make sure that I could measure, you know, we're all educators here, how, how to me measure engagement. So I actually think I'm doing pretty well right now. My goal was to have 90% of people not look at their cell phones. So I don't know if you guys have been to conferences lately, but like, and maybe that's just the California thing, but everybody's just like always on the cell phone. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be seeing, and if, I, if you guys do look at your cell phones, it's okay, like that's, that's, that's your choice. But that's, that's my responsibility. So that's my goal, one of the ones that I'm going to have here. Um, the other thing is that uh, I wanted to just start out by just sharing a little story and then uh, a video, and then I'll kind of go through everything. Um, and before I do, I, I think that, you know, I wanted to actually start with this, 
not because of college track. It, you could change and substitute college track for anything, but uh, because of college track, I didn't just make it to college, I graduated. So that's the key message here today. Um, and you're, uh, it's not about getting in, it's about getting through. It's not about making sure that kids are able to have access, but it's actually making sure that they succeed. So uh, I'm going to share a little of my story. So I'm actually not from California. I'm from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, anybody from? All right, go blue. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Came from a privileged background. Um, always knew I was going to college. Uh, and then I remember I went to UCLA, and um, it was around the time of the Rodney King unrest. I don't know if you guys were alive during Rodney King. Okay. I usually you know, have an audience that's maybe a little... Um, <laughs> you know, wasn't alive, but um, I'll have to modify that. Hold on a second. Um, so it was around that time, and I was like, all right, I want to I figure out, like, what's going on here? So I started a tutor in the inner city in, in South Central LA. I joined Teach for America. You guys heard of Teach for America. So I joined Teach for America. I taught in Compton for a couple years. And I remember when I was in Compton, I asked uh, the principal at the time, and she was principal of the year, and I put that in quotes for a reason. I said, Ms. Cornwell, I would love, I was a second grade stu a teacher. I said, I'd love to actually do a college workshop for my kids and their families. And she said, Silver, these kids can't even pass the test, and you want to talk to them about college? And I was like, look, are you going to open the door on a Saturday for me or not? She said, all right. So we had Compton Community College, we had UCLA, we had Cal State Dominguez Hills. And uh, what happened there was really inspirational for me. Because in walked, you know, about 20 parents and families, and they sat down, and they were like, wow, I had no idea that my kid could go to college even though I don't have any money. And that was an eye-opener for me because there is so much disconnect between what a lot of families think they can do and what they can actually do. Fast forward, I taught for a third year. I moved up to Oakland, taught for a third year there. And there's this one girl named Kahari. I actually just got a text from Kahari when I was uh, with Jasmine um, last night. And uh, she was a second grade student of mine. And we went, to, we went to college, and we observed at the college. And she's like, wow, I, had re I didn't realize there's people that look like me at this college. I could go. Again, a disconnect between expectations and reality. So then I joined. Uh, I ended up being the program director of Teach for America, so I could actually try to have more impact. I, I was uh, the program director for three cities in California. And then I heard this statistic that may not be so dissimilar to in Vermont, but in, in California, out of 20 kids, and again, there's going to be some interaction here, so I want to make sure that you can get it. So out of 20 kids, how many do you think are eligible to go to a University of California? I'm not talking about Berkeley. I'm talking about just any University of California school. So put it on your fingers. Out of 20 kids, how many do you think are eligible? I see 5, 10, 7, 10, 10. They need a little help here. I need some more. Not Two. We're getting closer. Um, there we go. What was your name? Yes. Kelly, thank you. One, one student. So I was like, wow. I taught 20 kids in second grade, and only one of them is going to get to go to college? Not even get to go, but be eligible. So I got together with a bunch of my students and their families. I was pretty tight with them. I used to do a lot of home visits. And I, I was in a room a little smaller than this. And I was like, hey, how many of you guys want to go to college? And they're like, they all raised their hand. I was like, well, how many of you think you're going to go? And they raised their hand. I said, well, actually, uh-uh. Only one of you is going to get to go. And they said, Mr. Silver, why are you being so mean? Why, why are you saying that? I said, hey, you want to do something about it? They said, yeah. I said, what if we create a new vision? Every single person from kindergarten on is going to be eligible to go to college. They're like, yeah, let's do it. So that was the birth of the school that the families, myself, and some educators created called Think College Now, a college prep elementary school uh, in Oakland. Uh, so I was there for eight years, and when I was there, um, you know, and one thing I also want to be clear is if you think that this presentation is going to be all about the successes, it's not. Because this work is hard. Uh, one of the things that I've learned the most is to learn from the failures, to learn from the things that we do wrong, is one of the greatest gifts. So I always think of it as like, you know, I'm kind of a dancer and stuff like that. And so like I, I think of... Um, I think of it as like a wave, the ups and the downs. So, you know, I, I talked about the fact that we launched this school, Think College Now, and all excited. And I walked in um, two years into it 
to the superintendent, state administrator's office, Dr. Randy Ward. He was with me in Compton. He was in Oakland. I sat down with him, and I said, somewhat arrogantly, hey, Dr. Ward, what do you think of our school? You know, I think he was going to say all these great things. And he said, you know what? You got some happy kids, a good culture, a big focus on college, but why don't you come back and talk to me when you get some real results? And that was a wake-up call for me. You know, because that hurt a little bit, but at the end of the day, I didn't create Think College Now for happiness. I created it with the families because I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to change people's lives. So, and our results were the same as the right next door. So I was like, all right, you're challenging me, let's go. So I was like, I ended up doing three things. One, I got a whole bunch of new people on board uh, that were teachers and, and, and uh, new leaders and Teach for America and some other people and they were all excited. Second is I actually observed at excellent schools around, uh, around the country. You know, one of the things I'm not proud to say, but you know, I've been in this educational equity game for like 20 years. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 25, right? Um, and I was like, that was a joke. You can laugh. It's okay. Um, and I was like, I've been in it for 20 years. And I was like, and I always said, like, all kids can learn. You know, uh, whether they're low income, whether they're high income, whether they're African American, Latino, Asian, white, whatever. But actually, until I actually saw it, I think there was a little part of me that didn't believe it. So when we actually went down to, to certain areas of LA and we saw kids in low income neighborhoods that were actually achieving at radically high levels, that broke down my own prejudices, that broke down my own stereotypes, and frankly, that broke down my own excuses. So I brought down my entire staff, all the teachers, all the administrators, and I said, look at this. They're doing it. We can do it too. What happened over the next five years, we did. So at that point, we focused on data, we had the high expectations, and we went from around 10% of kids at grade level to 60% in reading, 80% in math. Uh, we were the first California distinguished school in the, in the neighborhood, and Forbes magazine, and uh, I testified before Congress around like how to turn around a school in the No Child Left Behind legislation. This was about five years ago. So when I, when I came back from Washington, D.C., I sat down again with some of the same families that helped start the school. And again, I was kind of arrogant. You know, I'm coming back from D.C. and stuff. And I was like, so what do you think of the school? How's it going? And what did they say? Any guesses? It's going to be interactive. We can wait a while if you want. <laughs> what do these families say? So these are the families I promised them they're going to college. Yeah. Not working for my kid. Not working for my kid. What else? My kid's How do we pay for it? What? My kid's being left behind. My kid's being left behind. What they actually said was, you know what? We don't care about all these test scores or these things in the paper. You made us a promise eight years ago. You told me my kid was going to go to college and graduate from college. This is an elementary school. What happens after fifth grade? I was like, all right. So I'd gotten the kids $1,000 scholarships through this agency, but that's not going to get you all the way to and through college, as you guys know. And so I was like, I don't, I don't know. So I looked around. And I said, what's the best organization that gets kids from middle school into high school, graduating from high school, into college, graduating from college? And it was this organization called College Track. So I became the CEO of College Track four and a half years ago because I wanted to fulfill that promise to my kids and their families that they were going to actually graduate from college. Uh, and I felt like if I'm the CEO, right, I can get my kids in this program. Um, it's not that easy. But anyway, so, uh, so I've been there for the last four and a half years. And um, uh, what I'd like to do right now is share a, a video from, from College Track that just kind of is a little bit about the why. Um, because... What I'm going to do today is, is this is what we're hoping to, to get accomplished. So um, thinking about like the big idea is that uh, our objective is to figure out how we're going to increase graduation rates for first generation college students. So is that, is that in, are we in the ballpark? Is that generally why people are here? Because if not, you know, I, I, you know, there's some good pools out there that aren't heated and I could just <laughs> go in there and stuff. Um, so number one is, at the end of the day, the most important thing from my perspective, everybody, anybody can do a strategy, but the why. Why is it important? Figuring out what your why is, which you all know, 
but figuring out what the why is globally, nationally, uh, statewide as well. What's the good news? What have we done so far? Again, I've done a little bit of research uh, on, on some of you. What's the problem and the crises? What are some solutions? What are the outcomes we could produce? And then what's one strategy you want to use to increase the first-gen college grad rates here? So again, if you walk out the door and you don't have any inspiration, you don't have any strategy, I haven't done my job. So I want you to be thinking about what's one thing, not 10 things, but one thing you might be able to do. And then we're going to leave some time for questions. And I've already gone around and met some of you, so uh, I want you to fire questions. Like some people like, you know, like, oh, yeah, I don't want to, like, embarrass that guy or whatever, like, you know, bring it on. So, um, so with that, we'll go here. I have friends that sometimes they say, I'm going to drop out during high school. I'm like, why would you want to drop out when you can make your life so much better? My parents actually didn't go to college. They dropped out of elementary school to go help. Um, support the family, so they did, they know nothing about higher education. Yeah, I went through college track. I started in uh, my freshman year, so I think that was like 98. My name is Marlene Castro. Um, I am a college track alumni from the East Palo Alto site, and I am now an Oakland teacher fighting for my students. There's hope. There's always hope, especially for someone that is trying to make something of themselves. Uh, my little brother wants to go to Stanford, and. Uh, if, for those things to happen, you know, they need to have that support. They need to have people that believe in them, uh, be surrounded by uh, this, you know, this whole college track atmosphere in order for them to get there. The main thing is that I feel like it's going to happen once again. I have a 14-year-old at college track. I set an example for him, so he wants to go to college, and it's important. My name is Cheng Wei Liang, and I am a second year at UC Berkeley. Yeah, I utilize College Track a whole lot still because the resources are for me to use from, from middle school all the way till I graduate college. College was not even something I actually had in mind before I moved to New Orleans. I didn't even think I was cut out for college. I was the, the guinea pig for our family in the sense of like how to get through high school and how to apply to college so that my younger brother and now my younger cousins can also go through it with my support. Somewhere deep inside you is somebody that wants to succeed is somebody that wants to become more than what they are right now. So this program isn't just here to help the smarter kids, I just didn't get smarter. It's to help the kids that are falling behind so that they can get better. I want to go around telling people, we can do anything that we set our minds to. Even if it's in a little crowd and I'm only speaking to one person, that one person can pass it on to other people. I want the next generation to see us as the role model because the role models that I had growing up pushed me forward. We're strong role models. So if I'm a strong role model, that means the next generation gets a strong role model. And there comes an even stronger generation, an even stronger generation, so we'll become a generation that changes the world with everything that we do. When I first started College Track, my GPA was 2.0. But Gianna and, and a lot of College Track people, they, they gave me the support. They gave me the resources that I need to succeed. And my grades improved like by a lot. So my last GPA in high school was a 4.8. And without that, I'd be struggling so, so much right now. You, just, you don't even know how much these people have helped me. College Track is like my family. They're my blood. I bleed College Track. I think College Track has changed my life. I think it has made me get out there and talk to people and tell them, yes, I'm Chicana, and yes, I don't come from one of the best communities or whatever you want to say, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to call college. That doesn't mean I'm not going to get into Harvard. That doesn't mean I'm not going to become a lawyer, or maybe even president. That's what it means. College check gives us the ideas to do those things. I want to make a difference and impact my community by becoming a lawyer and just showing that we're here and that we have our own perspectives and that we can bring a lot to this country and make a difference. I literally feel like College Track is, um, was at that time and still continues to be a lifeline for how I am able to just continue to find success and be able to define that for people still in my community. I'm not just some other kid trying to go to college. I'm, I want to be somebody. I want, I want, I want to be somebody that people look at and is like, I want to be like him. I realize that I can be that person. Without College Track, I just would not be here today.
So um, what I'd like to do is actually, if you could turn to the person next to you and then just share kind of one, one thing that comes up for you when, you when you saw that. Anything that comes up for you, anything that applies to you in your context as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Just wrap up your last one. So um, love to hear if anyone has anything that they want to share out. Uh, I'm not going to have 100 people share out, but I'll take a couple of anything that came up for you and or, uh, again, that original question, which is what we're trying to get at. Why is this important? If there's anything you want to comment about that as well. Yeah. Uh, we actually, here, you can use it. Uh, the film moved me because that was me. I grew up in an immigrant family, parents working in factories and, you know, two and three jobs. No time to say, hey, you're smart. Maybe you should think about going to college. Nobody in our social circle went to college. And this brought tears to my eyes because the reality is when kids like us get to go to college, we inform the conversation in ways that it wouldn't be informed otherwise. Thanks. Thank you. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. I appreciate that. Take one or two more. Yeah. The hardest thing I frequently find in my classes is convincing students that they can actually do the work, that it's worth putting in that just extra little bit to do something more than memorize and spit the factoids back at me, but to actually come to an understanding. And I'm dying to know what you're doing to give those kids that sense of self-efficacy and responsibility. Yep. Thanks. Take one more. Yeah. Believe it, you can achieve it. Mm -hmm. yep. The power of, of instilling in students a belief that they can rise above any situation, whether it's in second grade, all the way up into uh, you know, first year in high school or beyond. Uh, you can make a difference. Uh, on the elementary school level, I see it every day. And in middle school, it's tough. We've got to reach them at an early age, and I applaud your efforts in terms of letting students know at an early age, you're college bound, or higher learning bound. Thanks. All right, um, we'll, we'll hold that for, for a moment. Um, so one of the things that you said there was the, the belief, and, uh, and it relates to the question that you had. So, you know, at College Track, we, we say that we provide two things, and again, this can apply to anyone the tools to succeed and the belief you can. The tools to succeed and the belief you can. So I actually do believe in the power of belief, I think, is a key thing. You can't just say, like, hey, go do it, and then not provide the resources or the tools. So we obviously, we have to have the tools, but we also need both of those things. I think it's the heart and it's the head. A couple things I wanted to highlight from the video, too, that just kind of stuck out that I think relate to this. Um, if you saw a couple things there, it talked about, um, I don't know if you remember when the, the student from New Orleans said, like, it's, it's like my college track is like my family. I bleed college track. So think about that. So you're in a classroom, right, and you're talking to a, a student. Are they more likely to, like, dig deep? Are they more likely to keep going if they feel like you really, really are like their family? And I'm not just talking about like, you know, like, oh, you know, you care. Everybody cares. But like that relationship, that's really the key. And, you know, relationships don't actually take a lot of resources. One of the things in, in my research of, of some of the schools that you have, you guys got a big gift in that you're, you're generally your student to teacher ratios are much smaller than in California. And that's actually like college track. I mean, we're, we're not a school. Like we're, we, got, we got good ratios too. So one of the things I would just encourage you to think about is how do I leverage, how do I create and how do I leverage the relationship to create that family sense? The second thing I want to say, and this is somewhat controversial, but like, you know, it's not about you. It's not about like me. It's about that student and getting to the goal. I, you know, I, I say things sometimes and people are like, what? But like, I, 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 I don't care at all how it's done. I just care it gets done. I don't care what the process is. I just want to hit that outcome. I don't care if the kid is happy or whatever. I just want them to have a college degree. So the question is, how do you do that? 
So to me, sometimes, like, everybody's got gifts. Like, I'm really bad at, like, like I was in my hotel room, and, like, my stuff's all over the place, and I'm not very organized and all that. But, like, I can connect with kids, right? Or other people, they're like, you know, they can actually do a lot of things, but maybe they, they're not as good at that. So do whatever you can do to make that relationship. I'm not actually saying you need to create the relationship with the child. I'm saying the relationship needs to be created with the school. So whether that's you or whether that's someone else that you know is really good next to you that like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to reach this kid and I can't. I need your help. Maybe they have the same you know, ethnic background. Maybe they don't. Maybe they have the same you know, background where they're coming from. Whatever it is. So I think one of the things I just want to encourage you to do is don't be wedded to the process. Be wedded to the outcome and result and think strategically, how do I actually build that relationship? How do I invest that student to make it happen? A uh, couple other thoughts that I have and then we'll kind of move forward um, is um, the, the other thing that it talked about is, I don't know if you saw that stat, but it said that College Track tries to remove barriers uh, and then it also said that if you're a child that actually goes to college and graduates, your child will be, does anyone remember? What times? Three. Three times. So just think about that. It's pretty powerful. Like, you, you, you move one kid to graduate from college, it's times three. I mean, every single time you do it, it's times three. And I think that's something that when you're like, man, why, do I, why am I getting up in the morning or whatever, that motivates me that anything I do, it's times three. The second thing is removing barriers. Again, it's just like figuring out like what is prohibiting this particular child from getting to the finish line. For some, it might be finances. So figure out how to, how to get some type of partnership with that. So for some, it might be academics. So figure out how to get the tutoring for that child. For some, it might be they're, you know, they're breaking up with their boyfriend or their girlfriend or whatever. Like figure out how to get the counseling. Whatever it is, figure out what is the barrier and remove it. That is your job in addition to actually educating the student because when you remove the barrier, you will be able to more likely educate the student and again, get to the finish line. Yeah? I think we have some students, even if they are paying for part of their college themselves, they don't really, at least early in their career, they don't want to try. It's too cool. Yep. I don't want to read. Yep. I just want to show up. Yep. I just want to sit. So what do you do with that? Yeah. Well, I, so I, that's a good point. So I remember I was, uh, so think college now, and I, I don't want to um, actually I'll put this right here. This guy right here. So I'm at Thanksgiving last November. I'll get to your question. I'm at Thanksgiving last November, and I'm so pumped. So remember, I, we got these second grade students from Think College Now, and we promised them they were going to go to college. We got them $1,000 scholarships. We said they were going to do it. So we had 39 second graders. How many, does anyone have a guess, how many of the 39 actually went to college? They're, in, they're freshmen now, so any guesses? Three. Three. So 31. So we had 31 out of the 39 ended up going to college. It, it's good. Um, and um, six of, uh, not good enough, but, but, but a good start. And basically what we did was, I was like, one of them's going to Santa Cruz. Actually, three of them are going to Santa Cruz. Some of them are featured here. That, that woman, that Claudia, which you'll see a video of her later on, and, and Edgar, uh, and the guy. And I was like... Um, Thanksgiving dinner, and the woman was like, you know what, I think you should call Claudia. So, so again, remember, utilizing your resources here. So I'm at Thanksgiving with someone who was a teacher at Think College Now before, uh, 10 years ago, and she works at the school that she came from, the high school, and she heard a rumor that Claudia was struggling. So what did I do? I went down, and I went down, I drove down to Santa Cruz about an hour away, and I was like, Claudia, I'm going to be here, like, what's up? So what I found was something a little shocking to me. So there were three kids at Santa Cruz that were there. So Claudia, she was, she was struggling a little bit, but there were two other kids there. And Claudia wasn't on academic probation, but the other two were. So I'm like, wait a minute. I got one problem here, and now all of a sudden, again, times three, I guess. That's the theme here. So, um, so the Edgar right here, he's got the same thing that you talked about. Edgar's smart as heck, you know, like... And I was like, so what's up? So I remember sitting down with them at, uh, I got the EOP director. I don't know if you guys have that, but like sometimes there's a, a, a person that is in an office that helps low-income students specifically. I don't know what it's called out here, but in affirmative action, EOP, AAP, whatever it is. 
And so I'm tight with the guy at Santa Cruz. So I was like, dude, you got to come. Let's have lunch. We'll have pizza. I'll bring the kids together. Let's figure it out. And uh, he's like, all right. So he comes. So we're at the pizza thing. And I sit down with the kids. And the first thing I say to him was, you know, let's cut the bowl. Tell me the real deal. I want to know what's going on. I didn't work my ass off for the last 10 years to make sure that you're going to college and graduating from college for this to fail. What's up? So the reason I said that was, remember, if I would have said that to somebody else that I don't know, they're going to be like, get away from me. But I have a relationship with them. I visit their families. So I'm able to leverage that. So I actually asked. I said, Edgar, what's up? And he says, well, man, I'm pretty smart. You know, I always get A's, so I haven't really been going to class. <laughs> I was like, OK. All right, thank you for telling me the truth. And um, he's, I was like, so you know, what, what are we going to do about that? He's like, I don't know. And I was like, well, do you want to graduate from college? He's like, yeah. I said, well, then you better get to class. And so, but again, I want to also emphasize here. Let's see if this keeps going. So you see that guy on the left? Troy, you recognize that guy? African-American guy? So he introduced Michelle Obama at the White House um, when College Track was featured to like, uh, it was a college opportunity summit. Obama called it to say like, you know, it's not okay that low-income kids are not achieving at high levels. So he was a specific person. Technology is one of the things I'm not very good at either. But um, so he introduced Obama, and I was like, Troy, why don't you come down? Like, let's hook up here, because I want you to talk some sense into Edgar, you know? And so he says, you know, he says, look, Edgar, what's up? He says, you got to go to college. You, you got to go. And then another gr girl that was there who was uh, also from College Track, she said, you know, you got to go to office hours. And she's like, oh, OK. So the point is, is that using my leverage, using other people's leverage, now Edgar is off of academic probation. So uh, back to here. So let's, uh, let's dig in here a little bit. So uh, why is this important? So yeah. Did he tell why? Yeah, why should you go to class? What's your goal? That doesn't tell me why class, going to class is important for graduating. Well, again, it... Um, I didn't hear you say the, uh, why. Why? Yeah. I think, I mean, you, you could do it in a couple different ways. From my perspective, it's about the outcome. I knew Edgar wanted to go to graduate from college. He worked his behind off to do that. So that's why, because that is a a mechanism to do it. He also wanted to be an engineer, and so he enjoyed the learning of that as well. But yeah, it's whatever that person is going to excite them to do it, from my perspective. So, um, so here, why is it important? So I mean, you guys know the stats. This isn't anyway, but like, bottom line is, you get a college degree, you're two times likely to get more employed, um, and you're going to earn a lot more money. Does anyone know, if you get a college degree, about how much money over a course of a lifetime you're going to make more than if you don't? A number, yeah. This, did you, did you, did we talk before? Yeah, okay, yeah. Million. All right, yeah, it's a million dollars. Yeah, very good. Um, all right. Okay. Over here, same thing, you know, it's in your PowerPoint. You could look at it, but the bottom line is if we really want a society where we have people voting, where we have a democratic society, volunteering, contributing to the community, going to college is a ticket to get there. So, um, why is this important to you? And um, why do you do the work? And um, why is this so hard? Um, I'd like for you to just take a quick moment, tell the person next to you why this is important to you. All right, I'm going to come back together, make it a little tighter. Thank you. All right. All right, so now you have that in your head, the why of why it's important. So uh, if you look up here, anybody know this guy here? So that's my kid. So for me, one of the reasons this is important is I want what's best for my kid. I want him to have choices. I want him to be able to do what he wants to do. I want him to be able to pursue his dreams. But it's not just about my kid. If I want that for my kid, I want it for every kid. Over here. Why else is it important? Well, can someone read that quote? <laughs> Maybe not. All right. Anybody read it or no? Yeah. Give it a shot. 
I will graduate from college, and when I do, I will not only be doing it for myself, but my mom, who did not, and my cousins, who did not come close, and the future women in my family who will have me as a role model to look up to. And that's from Christina, CTSF. College Track San Francisco, yeah. So just, just think about that. Again, this relates to that three times. The bottom line is, why are we doing this work? Because this is not going to just have an effect on Christina or whoever's in your classroom, but it's going to have a ripple effect. It's going to change the lives of the students. It's going to change the lives of their kids, and it's going to change generations. If we truly want educational equity where all kids have an opportunity in this country, you are the actual ticket to that. We are the actual ticket to make that happen through four, but also through people like Christina. So this is a slide I always like to see here. So now we're getting, you know, why else is it important? So did you guys know this? So is that surprising to you at all? One out of five kids that's low income graduates from college. Are you clear, too, that this is not kids that started in kindergarten or even 12th grade? These are kids that are actually in college. So let's just say that again. So, so out of, you got a bunch of freshmen in your class, at least nationally, only one out of five is going to graduate. Yeah? Uh, this is the six-year rate from a four-year college. So getting a bachelor. So bottom line is, we got a national crisis here. Now, here's the good news. So this is the research that I did on you guys. So, you know, if you look here, I've never actually seen this before. But in the, the organizations that you're with, the colleges that you're with, you actually are graduating kids that are first generation at the same rate, or actually, ironically, the Pell recipients are even, and first gen are even higher than some of the other students. Do you get that? So like, you're doing it. In terms of equity, you're getting it done. Let's give you guys a hand. And I, 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 the reason I wanted to focus on that is because it's a big deal. Like, it's a big deal. Like, I, again, I, I haven't really seen that very much. Like, usually, the, you know, the first gen rate is here, and then the, the low income is here, and the higher income is here. And, and it's so critical. Because if I'm going to come in here and say, like, hey, do this or do that, you ain't going to do it. But if you actually see, like, actually, we're getting some good stuff done, I want to take it to the next level, that's what we're talking about here, building off this success. So I'd like you to actually think about right now, why do you think that is? So I'm not going to have you turn to the next person, but I'd love to hear, like, why is it? Because I'm actually, actually legitimately curious. Why do you think at the universities that you all are at, first gen and Pell eligible students are doing as well or better than higher income students? What, what are you doing right? What, what, is, what is helping? What are some strategies? Yeah. I think one of the greatest things in our system is that we have a low student to faculty ratio. Yep. So we can get to that personal family level that makes them successful. Yep. So again, huge leverage point. Family relation. Go ahead. You take that side of the room, I'll take over here. So yeah. I only know Vermont Tech, but I imagine true of many of the Vermont State Colleges. We have an excellent um, student support services here that are really outreach and really do good, do good work with the students. Okay. I'm going to push on you for a sec. What does that mean? So give me one example of what that outreach is. What's one strategy you've done at your university that seems to be successful? Um, you know, just an example. I know students very often will meet and get support over there, come back to me, tell me about all the help that they're getting, individualized. Um, and, you know, talking with people who believe in them and that they're going to make it through, and that makes a world of difference. Awesome. So, again, I keep hearing this individual relationships, a belief. Let's get a couple more. This is the time, you know, if you came to the conference, you want to, like, say some good things about your university, this, this might be a good time to do that. Yeah. I think the work ethic is better with first-time college. I feel that the work ethic is better with first-time college students um, compared to the higher, higher uh, socioeconomic students who might feel a sense of entitlement, yep. where the first generation college student um, just works a little bit harder towards reaching those goals. Thanks. Uh, I already got you. Uh, uh, let's get one over here, and then we'll, yeah, I cut you off before, so I apologize. That's all right. Yeah. Um, I know um, that our, our state uh, community college system has an excellent um, uh, program for um, 
uh, professional development of, of uh, faculty. Okay. There are programs like this that, that are offered online learning. There are lo lots of supports, and I think teachers really enjoy teaching here. Great. All right, so um, we're going to hold that, and if we have more time at the end, we can, uh, we can say some more. Because again, I'd encourage you throughout the day to be able to share best practices. Don't get it just from me, get it from each other, because a lot of that is in this room. So, um, sorry. So, but there is a problem. So, you know, I, you, know you always do that sandwich, like, the, you know, the good stuff and then the, the challenges. So, the good news is the Pell eligible, the low income are doing as well or better than the other, but the bad news is we still got six out of 10 kids in our system here that are not actually graduating from college, which is better, again, than the national average for low income. So I just want to reiterate that, but it's still not where we want it to be. So I want you to be thinking about why that is. Um, and then also the other problem, and I was speaking to a couple people before, is you got, you got this other issue that a lot of people are not necessarily enrolling in college, which I know has a ripple effect on budgets and has an effect on a lot of things too. So, um, so one of the things that I wanted to share here and I want to you know, emphasize is kind of how we can actually do two things. How do we actually get the kids into colleges more and how do we make sure that they graduate? Okay. Uh, last thing, and I'll do this very quickly, again, this is another why, even though high school grad rates, as uh, Yasmin talked about before, are going up, we still got major problems in the country, and it's not good enough. All right, so here we go. So now you're like, all right, you talk for a while, you got a little inspiration, like, what, what, what are we going to do? So I'm going to take the next five to ten minutes to just share some specific strategies that we have. And I want to also say a couple things. So you got some of this in your PowerPoint too, so if you want to write some stuff down, that's great. If you don't, like you got it there. You also have in your, um, in your packets something called the student stress calendar. So this is a very practical guide. If you're like, I'm not going to remember anything from here, you take this blue guide and you know like, all right, I got my kids in my, it's, it's October. What might be some of the things that are stressing my kids out? that I might want to address or get counseling to address or support services to address. So this is kind of a cheat sheet of having this on your thing. If you do nothing else, you just say, hey, well, in October, they might be missing their family or in, et cetera. So this is specific problems that they might have so that you know what you can do to help solve them. So that's one strategy. And then the last thing is uh, some of you might have seen, anybody see the video, the Politico thing that uh, Yasmin sent out? So in that, there's some specific strategies. If you didn't see it, uh, the video that she sent out, obviously it was really exciting to you, I'm seeing no hands. Um, again, you can laugh, it's okay. Uh, but you can listen to that, and I have some specific strategies there of what we can do. But I'll say a couple right now. So one is this is key. W what do you get from this, this, vid this uh, visual here? Does anyone have an idea? Why did I put this up here? Did I put it up to like brag about college track or what, I mean, what, what, what do you think is my point here? Yeah. You plant the seed early. Yeah. The point is, is that it's not enough. You guys can't do this alone. You can't just have one of the things that's so frustrating in this country is like you got college over here, you got high school over here, you got elementary and pre-K. We got to connect the dots. So specifically, that's what college track tries to do. So we try to do 10 years develop deep relationships, which we've talked about, help them in the key transition points. So that's really key here. I cannot emphasize that enough. One of the things that you can do if you want to make sure kids actually go to college and actually graduate is look at those transition points. Look at, at your university, what are you guys doing to actually support them? And then what are you as a professor doing, especially in those first couple weeks or especially in the summer before? Because a lot of times, I remember I was so excited. I was like, all right, college track. We had nine, you know, we had, we had these statistics that are horrible and like, you know, one, very few kids are going to college. But then we had 94% of our kids at college track got accepted to a four-year college. Like, all right, that's cool. But what happened? Only 80% went. So what happened to the other 14? Part of that was because we didn't do enough outreach to make sure that happened. Part of it is they might have enrolled, but then they just dropped out right before in the summer. So thinking about what kind of summer programs do you have at your university between, for that is super, super important. And again, you might be saying, well, I'm a teacher or a faculty. I don't know if I have control of that. But like, you know, I'm, I'm going to push here a little bit. You guys have some power. You know, like push your deans, push your boards, push your other people to make sure. Because if, if we really care about 
getting kids to get to the finish line. It's not about one person or the other. It's about what can we do together to make it happen. So those summer programs before freshman year are critical. The other one, when a lot of people drop out, most of the people drop out in there right before freshman year, during freshman year, or right after. When you get kids that are coming back for their sophomore year, you're good. Not 100%, but in general, they're going to graduate. So that other one is make sure they come back the freshman, in between freshman and sophomore year. What do you have in your schools that is going to incentivize them to come back? What can you do? You build a, you know, let's say you got 20 kids in your class and you've got a good relationship, you know, and I'm going to be clear, like I'm not tight with all those kids. I didn't visit all 39 of them. I visited five or six. But who are those five, four or five kids that you know that you actually made a connection as a, when they were freshmen and are you going to be calling them over the summer? Are you going to be texting them? Are you going to do something like that? Again, I'm not saying to do it to everyone, but you know the people that you have a relationship with. And the ones you don't, do you know someone else that's a colleague at your school or in support services that might be able to as well? So summer, freshman to uh, sophomore year is key. And then the other thing is the high school piece. And again, this is somewhat controversial, but I want to push on it. I was talking a little bit um, to the president uh, of this university before, like, I, I was so shocked, and I was talking to, last night, like, so in California, you guys know what we make in uh, so K to 12, how much money, uh, how much do you guys get uh, K to 12, like your uh, per pupil or whatever, what is the number about? 15,000, something like that. California, it's five to 10,000. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one. Uh, I, I thought it was 15, $15,000 per kid for the high, you know, K to 12, annual. Bottom line is this. You got this interesting system here where your kids are getting a, your, 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 your state is putting in a lot of money into middle school, high school, and elementary. So I was like, so well, what do you do about that? And they're not actually putting a huge amount into colleges from my understanding. Um, so, so what's the logical thing to do? Does anyone have an idea? Boom. It's right there. So look at this. That's why I put this up here. You've got to partner with K-12. to They got the money, and they actually have the relationships. If you want them to hit the finish line, we got to partner together. And somebody said to me, well, but do they care? And I was like, well, so I was an elementary school principal. Elementary. I cared that my kids are going to college and graduating from college. Does every elementary school principal? No. But you all know that there's some elementary school principals or teachers or whatever, or more likely middle and high school, that do care. If they don't care about their kids, you're in trouble. But you, if you can figure out what are the schools that are near your university that do, and then figure out how to partner. I mean, it's asinine to me. If I have $15,000 that's coming in, I would love to pay $1,000 to the college or the scholarship to gap fund so that my kid could actually graduate from college. Like, it's a good investment. We're not asking them to pay all 15, right? So, like, I'm just saying, like, figure out what the partnership. And then what are you going to do? Are you going to come in and provide support services? Are you going to excite them? Are you going to provide maybe interns or tutors for those high school kids that are struggling or middle school I mean, I got it at my school. I got the, I got the high school, college kids. They're working with the elementary school kids, so they're all happy. and Because uh, they may not have the good ratios like you guys have. I, I don't know, but at least the bottom line is, is that you have resources in terms of kids, in terms of people, in terms of internships, in terms of tutoring, in terms of some exciting things. It's college. Use that. They got some money. They got some other stuff, too. Try to develop a partnership as well. At College Track, we only go into areas where we have a deep partnership between the college and the high school as well and partner together. Um, so does that make sense at all? Yeah. OK. All right. Um, and I'm not saying it's easy, but so here's, here's a couple other specific strategies. So in addition to partnering with the K-12, in addition to the summer stuff and the relationships, here's a couple others. So these are why we're successful at College Track that I think can apply here. Ten-year commitment, we talked about that before. So again, that partnership. The other is um, academic advising. I think you guys have probably heard the term intrusive advising, right? Like, I, that's, that's the real deal. It's not, it's not a rocket science. Like, get in their face. Be, build a relationship. Make sure that they are actually going to class, going to office hours. I often say if the kids don't do, it's on them. But if they don't know, it's on us. So like, the bottom line is we need to be, keep telling them over and over and over again. 
and we need to make sure that we figure out how that message resonates with them. So the academic advising is huge. Mentoring, too. Can you make sure that every single kid on your campus has some kind of trusting mentor? You might say, well, we don't have the resources for the adult. Maybe it's a peer. I've heard some people do some peer-to-peer -peer stuff here. Whatever it is, figure out a way that they feel connected. Financial support. I know this is a hard one, but, you know, I mean, I think at the end of the day that finances are a key thing, too. So figuring out, I want to tell a story about uh, a school, um, Franklin and Marshall, you guys heard of that? So Franklin and Marshall, it's not Harvard, it's not whatever, but Franklin and Marshall is where I want my kids to go. Because Franklin and Marshall prioritizes low-income kids and gives them extra resources. They actually are able to do that. And they, the president knows a lot of the people there, the kids. They're, they're, they do fly-in programs where we, they fly in the kids and stuff like that. They're prioritizing things that are going to help. They do those summer bridge programs, all that. So again, it's not about the selectivity of the college. It's about the support systems and the priority of the college. If Franklin and Marshall can do it, you all can do it too. Um, and then the other, uh, the other piece here is that home. That home, I, I talked about it before. Like at the end of the day, the soft skills matter. And again, I'm a test guy. Like I'm pushing and pushing and pushing and outcomes. But if they don't have that relationship, so build that home. Every one of you could build that home sense of family in your institution. Um, okay, a couple other things here too. I highlighted the black ones here as things that might be relevant for here. So we talked about that, that summer, tr brand, tr summer pr uh, bridge program. High school, uh, college visits. I don't know what type of college visits you're doing, but I mean, come on. Like if you want more kids to enroll at your university, get to the high school, pay for the bus, you know, or, or, or figure out a way to get them there and get them on the campus. I can't tell you how many kids are like, I wasn't sure I was gonna go to college, but then I saw it, it was so cool. You guys, I mean, I, I'm looking around here, I'm like, this is pretty cool. Like, this is exciting to kids in middle school and high school. I'm so excited about the, the legislation that I think the governor just signed with the dual enrollment. I was talking to you about that before. Like, that is awesome. Because I think there's statistics that show that actually kids will graduate more from college if they're dual enrolled more than if they were in AP classes. I mean, AP classes are good, but the point is, inertia, make things easy, make things debunk it. For a low-income kid or a first-gen kid, they don't know college, they don't know all this stuff, but all of a sudden if you're like, oh yeah, you're taking your last high school class on this campus, they're there and they're like, oh well, of course I'm gonna keep going. So dual enrollment to me is a, is a, is a great opportunity to increase enrollment and increase college graduation rates. Uh, high school, um, I think we've talked about most of these things so I won't say anything else, but again, getting kids to visit the college I think is key. Um, and then you can look at some of the, some of the rest. I'm pushing forward because I want to make sure we have time for questions. This is just a, quote, a couple of quotes that I think kind of, again, illustrate that too. So you can just read that and then get a, get a sense of kind of the kind of things that helped Johanna be the first in her family to graduate from college. And you can think about what might apply to you. So I want to focus on the last thing there. Do you get that? How many of you have people in your institutions that actually were first gen or were able to do that? Because those are people that, you know, I'm not first gen. I mean, I can connect with kids and it doesn't mean you can't if you, if you don't, but it's an added advantage. Johanna is the one that's advising the kids now. She's coming back to the community. So thinking about how to leverage peer to peer as well. Uh, these are just some stats about College Track. You can look at it on your own. This is the results that we were able to get. You saw that from the video, two and a half times uh, national average, but still not good enough. Um, and then the last couple things I wanted to talk about was just the staff. So when I went to Congress and I testified before, and they said, well, what's the most important thing that y you guys were able to do? I mean, right here, this is, the, this is not College Track. This is Think College Now, the elementary school. This is, uh, this is it. At the end of the day, if you got an incredible staff that's committed, <laughs> That's more important than anything. And that's what you all are. So you have an opportunity to be that, the key lever. Any policy, any money doesn't mean anything without the people delivering the instruction, without the people building the relationships. So last uh, couple things before we go to questions. I'd love for you to talk to your partner as well as write down one thing, and feel free to look at the stress calendar if you want, or look at some of the PowerPoint, or reflect. 
What's one strategy that you can use or one thing that you got out of this presentation today that you could actually use? Um, it's not a trick question. So again, it could be certain inspirational, and it could be certain strategies, it could be certain partnerships you're going to develop, certain relationships you're developing, whatever it is. But just write that down, take a minute or two, and then share it with the person next to you. That's my kid too. Yeah. All right, let's uh, wrap up your last thought. If you haven't written anything down, you could write it in the next 20 seconds. All right, this is what I do with the class. Five, four, three, two, one. 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 Join me, baby. Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. Need a little energy here. Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, I need three ideas because I want us to actually, this is the best part. So some of the ideas you got from me, great, but like you're going to get some from others. It's going to spur ideas. So a couple ideas, and I want them quick and just, just fire them out. More, uh, m more moments at the very first of the class, both online and in the classroom, for deep motivational question and answer discussion. Uh, who's first generation? Uh, how, how much is money a problem? How deep is your commitment to get through this course, this, co this college experience? How many of you are going to go through to the bachelor's degree? I'm at CCB. Uh, and uh, what, why not for the rest of you? Uh, make that the very first moment in class. Awesome. This is what we like to do. Two claps. <laughs> Try that again. Two claps. All right. Anyone else? Sharing the stress calendar with some of our first year students to help destigmatize de some of the things that they might be feeling their first, first time away from home and, and whatnot. Awesome. Okay. Anyone else going to use that stress calendar at all? I know it's good for me to just de stress. Massages are good too, but yeah. Anything else? Yeah. First day of class. Oh, sorry. Two claps. Very good. I was very uninclusive, by the way. Yes. Thanks for clapping. Yeah. Um, first day of class, writing on the board the various colleges and universities that my community college students have gone on to and making the commitment and saying, if you do well in this class, I will work with you. I will help you to get to where you want to go. Two claps. I'm really glad you actually said that because I didn't address it, but that is so key. I, we have, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but in California, it might be different in Vermont, but you are three times as likely to actually graduate from a four-year college if you don't start in a community college. Starting in a community college can be an amazing opportunity, but only if you've got someone to handhold you, take the right classes, set that expectation and support. So if you are in a community college, all the things I said, you've got to do it times five. Like You've got to make sure that they're just supporting the transfer rate as well. Um, take one or two more. Telling them they're all gifted and show them through a multiple intelligence test and um, the transitions of what they're coming from and their interests and say, you are gifted and you know you can do it and we're, go we're here to help you. Thank you. Two claps. <laughs> Take one or two more. Yes. Uh, actually, I don't know if you've spoken yet. Have you? Uh, no. Okay. I don't know if she has either. Uh, she um, did, actually. Ab but, yeah. About the summer melt issue, so my idea is that we reach out to the Vermont high schools for whom we have accepted students, but if they haven't deposited, and go back to the high schools and say, okay, we've got these students from your high school that have been accepted, but they are, you know, we haven't seen them yet this summer, um, and see if maybe we can get high schools to partner with us to help follow up with those students. Yeah. Yeah. Two claps. I love that. That is so, I mean, think about it. You're, you're a high school teacher. People didn't get into education for, for the money, right? They got in that, like, they want to see the kid in college. They're going to make that call. That call from that high school person that you've connected to is worth 10 of your calls because of the relationship they had. Partnership. Uh, we'll take one more. So I'm falling over here. I think the, the thing that caught my attention was the transition from freshman year to sophomore year. That, that we have, I mean, or at least at Vermont Tech, we follow up with the kids that are coming in and we do have a summer bridge program for incoming freshmen, but that melt after freshman year for the kids that 
maybe started in the wrong major and don't know how to get out of it or looking at the debt ahead of them and going, oh my God, that, that there's some opportunity to reach out to, to all of those folks. Great, two claps. All right, so we're almost at time here. So I want to actually just allow people to fire a couple of questions. We have five, five, ten minutes, Yasmin, or not? Yeah. Uh, so I'd love for people just to fire some questions, and then I'm going to close with a little inspirational video. Um, no questions. It's all clear. I want the heart. Yeah, go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about gender? Uh, we got a real problem in Vermont that clearly girls are making it. I, I got triggered to this by your s slide there, which was all women teachers, basically, with a couple of men thrown in there. And uh, this college in particular has have, have heavily boy-centric programs over the years, and that's an extra problem it has. We have terrible demographics in the state for students anyway. Um, our student population is way down. So free, in, in your experience, yeah. how are the boys doing? Yeah, uh, boys are, it, it's, uh, in general, it's been harder with the boys, uh, especially African-American and Latino males. So we do specific targeted programs for African-American and Latino boys. Again, I'm gonna, this is kind of, a, I'm gonna throw this back to you. W based on what I've set up here, what is the solution to get more boys to persevere or to get, to, to get excited to go in and persevere? Think about what I've been saying over and over. Who are the people that can get the boys, well, <laughs> it's kind of a, a funny question. Who are the people that can get the boys excited? But uh, who are the people that, that could get the boys to potentially come or to, or to again, sorry. Uh, who are the people that can get the, boy, the boys to actually persevere? Other, other boys, other men, other athletes, other whatever those things are that are going to motivate them. So my recommendation, what we did at College Track, is we got the most popular boys and they went into the other schools and they were the ones recruiting. So figuring out how do you leverage your male all-stars to support your other, all, uh, your other males. Other questions, I want, uh, I'd love to get like five questions in five minutes, yeah. I have a question that's based on some of my, two, two examples of my own experience. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I was teaching in a summer program at a private college in southern Vermont. And the summer program was very expensive. And there were certain slots in the program for what they called Vermont yep. scholars, which were underrepresented poor kids from rural areas in Vermont. And I had one young, one girl, she was about 16 in particular, who was so bright and she was so engaging. And I really, yeah. I mean, after the first week she came to me and she said, I'm going home. And I asked her why and she said, the other girls are laughing at me. I don't get along. I dress differently. I don't have the kind of clothes they do. Yep. And that's one example of not fit, fitting in the social strata. Another is, um, my, my ex-husband used to teach at a private high school, a very elite private high school, and the same kind of thing. There were yep. kids from the inner city, kids from poor neighborhoods, kids who were bright, who were scholarship kids at this school, and they would actually come into school in the clothing of their yep. neighborhood, yep. change in school, and before they even got on the bus, change again because yep. of the ridicule they would get yep. for being at this school from their peers. So, so what do you do with you, that? If you could address yeah. that. Sure. You know, I mean, again, I think it's, uh, it's on us. You know, what kind of culture are we creating where we are including in, uh, our kids and making it okay? So, at, you know, at Think College now we do uniforms. I didn't really like uniforms when I was growing up, but we did that so that it equalizes everything. So that's a policy that we did. Uh, another thing that you know potentially is around how do you celebrate the cultures? How do you celebrate the other things? I mean, I think somebody talked about like putting up, actually normalizing it in the beginning. So like, where are you from? Like celebrating it. Like, wow, you know what? If you get through college and you're the first in your family, you're actually doing a lot. And, I, and again, from my perspective here, at least, I might have the stats wrong, but I think you got about 50% of your kids that are first gen. So it's actually, you have actually a luxury in some ways that it, it shouldn't be so unnormalized in some ways too. So I would use the superstars, I would, I would be inclusive, et cetera. Uh, let's take a couple more. Yes, you just real loud. 
And uh, it's as quick as you can, just because I want to make sure we get to everybody. Um, how do students get enrolled in the college track program? Do they have to apply? And what kind of requirements do you, do they have to meet to yep. be accepted? So the way, I mean, college track is just one program. So that's an example. The reason I wanted to highlight college track is to figure out in, in Vermont, what are those bridge programs? What are those ones that you could partner? Because again, we're paying for it. We're raising the money for college track, so you can leverage that. Uh, and we ask 20% from the university or from the other people. So uh, at college track, we don't look for the highest kids. We don't look for the lowest kids. We look for the middle kids, 2.5 to 3.5 GPA. We accept about 50%. And the main thing we look for is a fire in the belly. We look for someone that is going to do whatever it takes to get that college degree. Um, other questions? Take one or two more. Yep. We have a lot of students that are coming back into, um, from, uh, have, who have dropped out of high school, coming back to college after five years, sometimes ten yep. years. How is that yep. um, applicable to the, that kind of student? And how can we build a partnership? I mean, from my perspective, it's the same thing. So it's, so you got someone that's coming back. So first of all, play from their strengths. So someone that's been back, they've probably been in the workforce, they've done other things. So celebrate them, be, have them be a resource for other people um, and make sure that they're feeling included. Um, and I would just ask them too, like what are things that would support you? What are the challenges? I actually don't know all the challenges of that. So I would figure out what are the challenges and then try to solve them. So, um, um, okay, go ahead. I, I'm, I work at Johnson State College, and I imagine it's the same in, in other institutions here, that the persistence rate with student athletes is, um, is high, comparatively Good. high. And I'm wondering, do you have any data from high school and middle school um, to inform the whole aspect of, of student athletes and persistence? Are you saying data of, like, is it high or what yes. gets them to stay? Or, or is it any different? Um, I actually... I don't. We actually have lower data in general because kids are going to the athlete, uh, the athletic stuff instead of coming to college track sometimes. So we act, instituted s Saturday classes to make sure that they could come. Uh, but I do think that makes sense because, again, they're feeling included. I mean, there is data specifically, and I think you guys all know this. When you get another thing I actually didn't mention is figure out whether it's through work study or something, get them a job on campus, get them an internship on campus, get them connected to a club. Uh, again, I'm speaking to the choir, but getting someone connected, I know when I was in college, that really helped me to be able to want to stay when I, when I left, or when I was thinking of leaving. Take one or two more. Yeah, real loud. So one of the things that, we're, that happens at community college is, especially new students, we're in the business of teaching students study skills on top of teaching the content, and I'm wondering if you have particular programs or approaches or ideas on that? Um, so I, I don't necessarily, I'm not an expert on study skills or that stuff. I think what I would just say is um, to figure out what are different partner organizations that might be able to support that. How can you leverage and connect with the high school so you're knowing what the specific things they know already to leverage that. Uh, but I'm not giving a great answer, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I need you to repeat what you had said before because if you're, if you're selecting people with fire in the belly, uh, they're, no wonder your stats are higher. We're trying to deal with the ones who are extinguished or not quite fire in the belly. <laughs> yep. And so did I mishear you? Yep. So uh, yes and no. So, um, so I, if you think about it, let me, let me tell a little story here. So Think College Now, the person who founded Think College Now, so we help to select the people that have fire in the belly, but we light the fire. We want to ignite the fire. So that person may not have the fire exactly, but we see a little bit of a spark. So yes, there might be something there, but these are not people that are like, oh my God, I'm going to all the way get there. What we say is people that wouldn't have gotten into college or through college without us, but do have the potential to do it with us. From my perspective, if they're on your campus, they have the potential to potentially get through as well. Um, yeah. Um, how do you address undocumented students and the application process as well as financial aid if, yep. if their family is undocumented? Yep. 
Huge thing. So College Track, we actually, um, so in true transparency, my boss was uh, Lorene Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' wife. She, um, and she's a huge advocate in dreamers, as we call them in California, undocumented students, even before it was kind of more popular. And uh, so we've always accepted undocumented students. Uh, in California, there's some legislation to be able, I don't, is there a legislation here that supports undocumented at all in Vermont or not? Anyway, private, you know, well, uh, we, we try to partner with them and try to find other scholarships. There are particular people that often will want to support Dreamers. So figuring out who are those donors, who are those partner organizations. Something called Dream.us is a partner organization we use. Um, and they, I don't know if they're in Vermont yet, but that's one of the ones. Um, so figuring out what are those. And then I think we also, uh, here, I think but maybe what's more applicable to you, forgetting the money part, is what we do is we actually, again, make it so it's, out in the public, and we make it so it's clear. So we have a dream summit where we invite all of our undocumented students to come to a conference like this and talk about specifically um, what are the barriers. We have panels of undocumented students. We have panels of undocumented parents to make it normalized and to actually provide those support systems and mentoring from undocumented to undocumented as well. I think last one, and then we'll close with the video. Yep. Hi, so could you talk more about how College Track exactly works? You said a little bit about 20% of funding from universities. Um, and, you know, working with the high school students, you know, early on, even earlier than that, coming through. So, I guess I'm still fuzzy on exactly how, it, Here, how it goes together. So, here's how it works. So, we recruit, we work with the middle school. Middle school um, counselors or teachers or principals identify kids that are struggling in their school, but have some kind of potential, and we uh, interview them. If they get in through the interview process, about 50% get in. We do a summer boot camp for them to support them in the summer. Then they come from 4 to 7 p.m., two to three days a week after school in high school. So it's an equivalent of an extra year of high school, tutoring, academic support, but also social emotional leadership, community service, summer programs, et cetera. And then we support them to apply to the colleges, to, to actually apply to a ton of scholarships. And then we make sure that once they get into college, we support them to transition and with a partner college, try to hand them off, as well as continue to support them with a mentor while they're in college. It's really eighth grade through, it's 10 years, eighth grade through college graduation. Think College Now, the school that I started, was in kindergarten. We do have a model that's from kindergarten, and those kids, if they go to a certain high school, are, are eligible to go to college track, so it could be kindergarten all the way through as well. Funding structure, it's mainly, it's a nonprofit, so it's mainly fundraising, 50% uh, probably from foundations, 40% from donors, 10, from, 10 to 20% from public sources, usually high schools or colleges as well. What's the per capita uh, cost, let's say, per student? For College Track, it's expensive. It's uh, $6,000, $7,000 a year. But what we say is $6,000, $7,000 a year, $70,000 for 10 years, what's that cost versus the prison system, what's that cost versus uh, other things as well? And what's a private school student paying to get into a private school or getting a private school counselor? It's usually twenty to twenty-five thousand a year, not seven thousand a year, and that's the kind of services we want to provide. So let me close here, and I'm going to stay. So if you have other questions, feel free, and I'm happy to email or talk to you. I'll be here right after, as well as I'll be here at lunch. I love um, talking about this stuff. Um, so let me close with this. Uh, you remember Claudia? So I talked about at Think College. Now we started with second graders. They were um, uh, 31 out of 39 went to college. We brought back for our 10-year reunion last May all the kids that were seniors to come back to us again to build that community to be able to stay connected with them and support. And this is Claudia in second grade. All right, let's see if we can get this here. All right, so poverty line. In June, students who attended the school will be the first to graduate high school, a goal that was put in their heads from day one. I want to do, be a doctor. Do you know what college you want to go to? At Berkeley. We're graduating to go to college, so I think it's like something really like my parents are really proud about, of me. They should be very proud. Claudia, uh, Claudia rather, actually picked UC Santa Cruz. She joined dozens of graduating seniors to share their college choices at a special gala tonight. The attendees celebrated the soon-to-be grads and the school's 10-year anniversary. The crowd also watched the story from ABC7 News reporter Leanne Melendez from eight years ago that I mentioned to show how far these kids have come. 
this is a dream come true for us because once they go to college and graduate from college, and that's going to have generational change across our entire community. In 2007, Principal David Silver said he would do anything to help get his kids to college, which included dancing on the roof as a reward <laughs> for reading. And there he was cutting a rug. Good on the moves. Roof. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much.